Excellent. So welcome, Martha, again to the classroom. Uh, thank you for being here today. Really looking forward to today's class. It's a big uh, class, major class, uh, covering the wine regions of the Old World. So essentially Europe, uh, we see on the map here, we're going to cover the four principal regions of France. Then we'll take a quick break, hop over to Italy and cover the three main regions there. Uh, and then uh, just at the end, uh, uh, we'll cover, we'll take a break after Italy and take uh, just a five minute break. And then finally cover the three other top producing uh, wine countries of Europe, so of the old world. So major class, so I hope you had a good breakfast and are excited and ready for uh, today's content. So uh, just a quick recap from last week. Uh, uh, we talked about what a grape variety is, kind of likening it to a dog breed analogy, being a vine species or vine variety. Uh, we talked about the four principal top white grape varieties. Uh, do you recall what some of them were? Four principal white grape varieties from last week and four principal red grape varieties from last week. Chardonnay, good, yeah. So that was one of the four white. We had Chardonnay, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, Riesling. Yeah, Sauvignon Blanc, great, Riesling. And Pinot Gris, Pinot Grigio. And for the reds, uh, yes, <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. So some of the reds, do you recall some of the reds we covered? Cabernet Sauvignon, very good. Merlot. Yes, Shiraz Syrah. So Shiraz Syrah, we covered Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, Shiraz. And the Heartbreak Grape, Syrah, yeah. The, the fourth one was... Miles has a love affair with it in the movie Sideways. Pinot Noir, which you just like, okay, okay, well, I wonder if I wonder if one day you might find one you really get enthralled with and captivated uh, by. Uh, great, so good, good review. Uh, if there's any questions, you can ask them here in the classroom on, on last week or week number one, or of course on today's content, uh, but let's dive in. Quick, uh, quick two minute video on Rioja, brought to us by the uh, Con Consejo Regulador. So the interprofessional trade organization for the wines of Rioja. And I feel it just captures the essence of uh, what an old world region is. Maybe a little bit of that history, the tradition, the grape growing and, and winemaking of the region. So let's, uh, let's take a little peek here. Are you getting the sound, sound and video on that okay, Martha? No? Okay. Just pause that there. See if I can pull it up again. Protects. Oh, was it, what, the video wasn't playing either? Okay. Couple of glitches today. Hope it wasn't too much of a hassle getting in. We'll see if this, this works here. I'm not getting any sound either. Okay, now? Good. That's the building for the Consejo in Logroño, the wine capital of Rioja.
Okay, so it goes a little bit more into kind of the the, the Consejo's roles and, and things that they do there. So I'll pause it there. Uh, but just a, a little video. I hope you had sound. There's none coming through on my end, but uh, I hope you had some uh, kind of nice music in the background there, as well as uh, hopefully it'll be on the recording as well if you're into uh, viewing the classes. Yeah, no, no words. Yeah, that's right. Uh, great. So again, uh, just kind of a, a good feel for what a classic old world wine region is. Rio has one of them, Tuscany, Chianti, uh, many of, of France, such as Bordeaux and Loire Valley. We'll take a look at uh, all of those today. So let's start with France. Uh, of course, you can't talk about wine without talking about France. And you can't talk about France without talking about wine. Uh, they've been, uh, they are first planted by the Romans, uh, and prior to then Gaul and some of the Celts, uh, were, were growing some vines, but really the Romans started it in Provence, a little bit in the Rhone Valley, uh, and as far north as, um, uh, Burgoyne, uh, and Bordeaux. We're going to focus on four of the top regions, Bordeaux, Bourgogne, uh, also known as Burgundy, but the French, uh, insist on calling it by the French name, Bourgoyne. Uh, so Bordeaux, Bourgogne, we'll talk about the Rhone Valley, both north and south, as well as the Loire Valley uh, on the northwest uh, coast, on the Atlantic coast. There are other great uh, phenomenal regions that unfortunately due to time and kind of keeping it reasonable today, we won't get into such as Alsace and Provence, some of the Languedoc, Roussillon and, and other regions of France. Uh, but again, hopefully with a, a wine 201, wine 301 uh, developing over the next little while. Uh, we'll get to dive into some of these really interesting um, uh, extra uh, wine regions of France. So focus on the four top uh, for today's class, including Bordeaux. Now, do you have uh, the two wines for today's class, Martha? Uh, we're going to get into that. We'll, we'll talk about what a Bordeaux AOC, I believe this is the Chateau Timberlay uh, for this week. Uh, and it, it will be a blend, uh, but we're going to dive into exactly what, what it's made of uh, there. So just if you have it open and in your glass uh, with you in front of you, um, try and assess what the fruit is like. Uh, so wine is made from grapes and should always have some fruit characteristics. Uh, uh, unless you get into really aged wines when it's matured, but there should almost always be some sort of fruit nature. So see what the f nature of the fruit aromas is like in your Chateau Timberlay. And also look for the level of tannins. Um, I don't believe we've talked about that yet. No caramel, okay. Berry is good, yeah. Uh, now, uh, can you get a little bit deeper? It might not be a very expressive uh, Bordeaux. This is kind of an everyday entry level. So getting berries is fantastic. They may be blackberry or cassis is a common, uh, black currant uh, uh, fruit is a common descriptor for Cabernet Sauvignon and even Merlot-based uh, wines such as this Bordeaux. So berries is excellent. Yeah, blackberry, fantastic. Raspberry, maybe cherry, black cherry, red cherry. Great, good, delicious, good, glad you enjoy, uh, really glad. Uh, so in addition to the fruit, try and assess what the tannins uh, feel like. So tannins is a mouthfeel, it's kind of an astringent uh, drying out of your palate, just like um, you know, if the dentist sucked out all the saliva out of your mouth, uh, tannins kind of do the same thing. They bind with the proteins in your saliva and dry out the front of your teeth and the gums and the inside of your cheeks. So. Um, see if you can feel a certain level of tannins. Uh, they may have a bitter taste, but they're, they're more or less a mouth feel. Uh, so are, the, are they kind of really drying out your mouth and really high tannins or medium tannins? Or are they a little bit lighter, a little bit softer, and only just a soft kind of prickly uh, drying out of the gums and, and front, of the, front of the teeth? Okay, so think about what the fruit is like on this Bordeaux. Think about what the tannins are like. Keep Try and keep this wine in mind. I'm really glad you uh, think it's delicious uh, because uh, we're going to look back to it next week when we took a, uh, talk about um, a, a New World Cabernet Sauvignon uh, blend. Medium, perfect. 
perfect. Medium tannins, that's pretty much where it should, uh, should be for this. Yeah, good, good. That's perfect. Uh, so let's talk about Bordeaux. This is a, a map here brought to us by the um, uh, uh, CIVB, the, the Commission Interprofessionnelle de Vain de Bourgogne. Thank you. Uh, so on this map, we're here we are on the west coast of France, kind of center, central France on the Atlantic coast. And we have the um, Gironde estuaries, that large stream of, of that river that's coming into France. It's a very low-lying area here in Bordeaux. Uh, I think the highest elevation is 60 meters or 40 meters, very, very, very low-lying uh, land. And in fact, towards the uh, north part of the Meduc, which is the purple part on the left bank, so the left side of the Garon River, Gironde River, as it's going up. So on the left bank in the Meduc, it's very low. And in fact, it used to be a marsh that was drained by the Dutch. Uh, so very low-lying gravel soils. A little bit further south, south of the town of Bordeaux, major uh, city of Bordeaux, in the orange district uh, is Grave, G-R-A-V-E-S. This is, and the orange is the district of Grave, named after the gravelly soils. So this is a very important soil type on the left bank. So the left side of the river as you're flowing north down the river. Uh, and the Grave is on the left bank of the Gironde as it flows into the Garonne. On the right bank, so in the pink, purple, uh, more pink, red, uh, on the very top right of, of this map, northeast of this map, we have the region of Saint-Emilion and Pomerol. And this is what you call a right bank. Uh, there's a second river, uh, the Garonne, that flows along with the Gironde into the, sorry, with the, sorry, there's the, the right bank is the Dordogne. Spell that out. Dordogne. So the, the river on the right bank is the Dordogne, and that flows with the Garonne into the Gironde. So good, quite a few terms, and, and that'll be a common theme uh, with today's class. There'll be a lot of regions and, and villages, uh, rivers, and different uh, uh, geographical features. Uh, and and uh, try not to feel overwhelmed by just the vast amount. Uh, the more you get exposed to the regions of France and Italy and Europe, and, and for next week, the New World, uh, it'll become more comfortable. So, uh, so there are two rivers. That's a great question. There are two rivers that flow into the uh, uh, Gironde. On the left bank, around the orange section, is the uh, Garonne, uh, G-A-R-O-N-N-E, Garonne River. That's on the left bank. Uh, and on the right bank is the Dordogne, which is uh, spelled T-O-R-D-O-G-N-E. And that's and, and in between the two, the, the green area is called Entre de Mer. Entre de Mer. I'm not sure how your French is, but Entre de Mer literally translates to between the two seas. So we're talking about the between the two rivers of the uh, Garonne on the left bank and the Dordogne. And so this green area is, is between those two rivers as the rivers converge and flow north into the um, Gironde estuary, right around the village, the city of Bordeaux. Great, good. So uh, a little bit of a tongue twister, but uh, the geography is very important because we'll see the gravelly soils uh, really affect the type of grape variety that can be planted and the clay soils on the right bank, again in the pink red uh, section around saint Emilion and Pomerol are more clay soils, so that's better for Merlot. Uh, and Entre de Mer, uh, we'll, take, we'll take a look at all of these uh, on the following slides. So just generally Bordeaux uh, on the whole, uh, produces about two and a half cases of wine per second. Uh, so that's 30 bottles of wine, 30 bottles of wine, 30 bottles of wine. Uh, every, every second, about 900 million bottles a year. It's the uh, France's largest wine region for quality wine production. Uh, there are so, There's one other region that is a little bit more area planted and produces more wine, the Languedoc. Uh, but in terms of quality production, uh, Bordeaux is, is number one for France. And about half that production is, uh, is entry-level uh, AOC Bordeaux. Uh, have you come across this term AOC, Appellation Origine Controlée? So this is the AOC. It's a legal classification in order to write Appellation AOC Bordeaux or Appellation AOC 
uh, Champagne uh, or any other appellation. It's a legally protected uh, region with winemaking rules and, and principles. That's right. Yep. Yep. So in Ontario, we have the VQA, Vineyards Quality Alliance. And these, uh, uh, Italy is DOC, DOCG, and these are based on France's uh, AOC uh, appellation laws. So very similar laws in Ontario as well as uh, United States and all over the New World. And uh, each country in France, uh, sorry, in Europe has its um, rough equivalent to uh, France's AOC. Uh, so AOC Bordeaux is the general uh, appellation for, uh, for the whole area. This, uh, your Chateau Timberlay may be an AOC Bordeaux. If you check on the label, it'll say Appellation uh, Bordeaux Controle, perhaps. Or maybe a AOC Bordeaux Superior, which again comes from the whole uh, appellation of Bordeaux, the whole region of Bordeaux. Very good. Very good. Okay, so uh, AOC Bordeaux Superior is very similar to AOC Bordeaux. Uh, where the majority of Bordeaux's production is in this, these two appellations, these two classified appellations. Uh, superior indicates slightly higher ripeness and alcohol and a little bit longer aging uh, versus the AOC Bordeaux. So generally a little bit better of a better made wine, slightly better made wine uh, for Bordeaux Superior than Bordeaux AOC, but both producing the majority of uh, Bordeaux's uh, regional output. Uh, when you get into kind of the creme de la creme, the top three or two or three percent of the region's production uh, comes from uh, some of the top chateaus. Uh, and interesting, yes, I like that. Uh, so, so we'll see how it's uh, the aging of wine in Bordeaux is very important. Uh, 2015 being a good vintage, and you know that's already coming up three and a half, coming up to four years old. Uh, so sh showing some evolution, but some of the top wines based on Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot will age for 10, 15, perhaps 20 years uh, or more in a good cellar and really develop these complex chocolate and, and um, uh, coffee and tobacco and sandalwood, these really savory uh, aged Cabernet Sauvignon uh, characteristics. Yeah, so so this uh, at this level, uh, the, these wines aren't going to age that that 20, 30 years, uh, but they'll they'll improve for two to five years, uh, and and then are ready to be enjoyed at fourteen ninety five especially. Uh, uh, some of these uh, most expensive, uh, longest living wines, some of these iconic wines, um, they can run up to sixty hundred, uh, two hundred, and some of the top chateau classified chateaus will be in the in the thousands for, for current vintage of, uh, of, of these age-worthy uh, Bordeaux wines. Yeah, me too. <laughs> uh, the markets have gone uh, really quite, uh, the supply and demand for this top, top, uh, the pyramid echelon for Bordeaux as well as Burgundy, we'll see in a few slides, Burgoyne. Uh, uh, the markets, the supply and demand curve is way out of out of equilibrium, and uh, and so the top chateau and the top domains of Burgoyne are um, are skywardly uh, extremely extremely expensive um, collectors' items essentially. Uh, so just focusing on Bordeaux again on the left bank, so following the uh, Garonne River as it turns into the Gironde, on the left side of that, flowing as the river flows on its left bank. Uh, this is the Medoc region, again, kind of in that purple, uh, and includes uh, top villages Margot and Poyac. And this is where the top chateau, this is where the Cabernet Sauvignon uh, dominated uh, wines that will live for 20 or 30 years and improve um, come from these two uh, villages on the left bank. That's an excellent point. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Uh, so the kind of the austerity, the, the less juiciness, less richness is very classic for old world uh, wine regions. And in the last 10 or 15 years, there have been quite a few regions and producers that are starting to produce more of a uh, juicy fruit, fruit forward style uh, uh, to, to compete on international markets, which many uh, wine tasters enjoy that fruit forward style. Um, 
so old world regions are starting to produce more, uh, but they just as often, perhaps more often, they'll produce in a more austere, that higher tannins, maybe higher acidity, and and meant more for aging, uh, aging or pairing with food. That that structure of tannins and acidity pairs uh, very well with food. Uh, so not as fruit forward up front, uh, but better perhaps for aging and or pairing with uh, food. Uh, and that's also a characteristic of characteristic of Cabernet Sauvignon, um, to be that that tannic and and high high astringency. Absolutely, yeah. So so uh, just in in short, when when you have a tannic wine such as this Cabernet Sauvignon, is medium tannins. Uh, when you put it in your mouth, the tannins bind with the protein uh, with the proteins in your saliva, and so that's why it feels astringent because rather than softening coating your gums, uh, they're being bound and dried out and so it gives you a dry furry kind of tannic uh, dentist uh, sensation the the key there with tannins if is if you have steak or uh, cheese a firm cheese uh, something that has protein then those proteins will the the tannins will bind with the proteins in the food rather than in your uh, saliva and that uh, then then gives you the flavor and uh, and it makes a very nice uh, synergy in 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 your palate as you pair with food, uh, we'll we'll see talk about this next week uh, with wine and food pairing principles uh, as well as new world wines. Uh, but really exciting uh, if you're into food and, and wine pairing, it can really elevate your uh, experience with with wine. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Uh, so left bank, we talk about the Medoc and Margot and Poyac uh, villages being more Cabernet Sauvignon dominated. On the right bank, it's more Merlot dominated. Uh, wines in the clay soils and the, the top wines here come from saint emilion as well as uh, Pomerol, just next to uh, saint emilion some of the garagiste wines and some of these uh, cult classics like le pain and uh, le pin sorry um and petrus and and these really iconic right bank merlot based um, wines uh, from the right bank the entre de mers region between the two seas is a large area uh, predominantly for uh, everyday Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon blends. This is a great variety that's famous in Bordeaux and blended with Sauvignon Blanc to produce excellent value, um, 15 to $20 range, maybe a little bit more, uh, but easily under 20, you can find a good value, good quality Bordeaux uh, Entre de Mer uh, with excellent freshness and balance and just a great summer wine, great summer sipper as the spring kind of approaches here uh, in the next few, few weeks and months. Uh, these wines are great, great summer sippers, great with a kind of a, a goat cheese salad or fresh summer salad. Uh, it goes really well. Uh, most of them, yep, yeah, almost all of them will be blended. So for the whites, Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc. For the reds, uh, uh, the one you have, for example, is predominantly Merlot with perhaps a little bit of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc. So uh, the three most common varieties for reds in Bordeaux are Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, in that order. And they're, yeah, very good. And they're also allowed to add uh, three other uh, grape, grape varieties. Uh, they include Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Carmenere. So in addition to Merlot, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Cabernet Franc, there's these three uh, great varieties here, Petit Verdot, Malbec, and Carmenere that are often added in small quantities to the blend, uh, but can add a lot of flavor and complexity and, and aging uh, potential if grown, uh, grown properly. Uh, so okay with that, that's, that's comfortable so far. Great, good. And I do have to take contention with, with your statement of stupid question. I believe a question is, um, is very intelligent uh, by its by its very nature. So, uh, of course, anytime you have a question, please feel uh, comfortable to to ask it. Uh, so, uh, white wines of Bordeaux. We talked about left bank. We talked about right bank. Talked about Entre de Mer. They're also very famous dessert wines from Sauterne. This is the yellow region in the very south on the left bank in the Grave in the orange Grave uh, region. The yellow component is uh, base is the region of Sauterne. And these are uh, complex, sweet dessert wines based on noble rot, which is a special fungus that when it, if, when it sets, sets in the vineyard in the fall, 
as the two, as a cool river and a warm river meet and creates a lot of mist, this noble rot will settle in. And then if you get warm, sunny afternoons, that keeps the, keeps the rot at check, keeps it from going into a malevolent gray rot. And you get these wonderful concentration and drying out, raisining of these uh, Semillon and Sauvignon Blanc uh, grape varieties. And then once those are pressed into kind of a paste and then fermented, you get a, a, one of the longest uh, lived, perhaps the longest lived wine uh, being Sauterne, especially the top uh, Chateau uh, here in Bordeaux. Uh, so really a, a delicious wine. There are other noble rot wines made in Loire Valley. We'll see later on uh, in the slide, uh, as well as Germany producing some. Austria produces some fantastic uh, nobly rotten uh, botrytis is the name of the fungus that settles in and creates these uh, delicious complex uh, dessert wines. Okay, so setting Bordeaux uh, to the left, we'll move into Bourgogne, uh, again known as Burgundy, but uh, uh, now being known, uh, promoted as Bourgogne, it's by its French name. Uh, Bourgogne is the only region that, in the history of studying it and writing about it, took on an English term, which is Burgundy. So we're getting back into uh, kind of its historic uh, Bourgogne uh, naming, and it's pretty much got um, five or six uh, components to it. Uh, so from north to south, uh, in the very top of this slide is Chablis, in kind of that yellow, yellow gold on the top. Uh, so Chablis is very quite a far distance. In fact, it's closer to the vineyards of Champagne uh, than it is to the vineyards of Bourgogne, but still considered part of Bourgogne, and we'll take a look at uh, Chablis wines. And then along the coat, uh, the coat, which is the slopes, so there's an east-facing escarpment, uh, which runs from Côte de Nuit, which is kind of the uh, magenta purple in the top part uh, and a little bit further south in the orange is the Côte de Bone. So the Côte de Nuit and the Côte de Bone make up the Côte d'Or, the, the orient facing, the east facing slopes. Uh, and further south in kind of that lighter purple violet is the Côte Chalonnaise, again Pinot Noir Chardonnay producing territory, as well as some uh, Aligoté. Uh, and further south in the kind of yellow gold is the uh, Côte Maconnaise, uh, which is home to some great uh, Chardonnay, a little bit warmer climate uh, here in this cool climate region. Uh, and further south still, as we approach kind of getting closer to the Mediterranean, you can see on the map of France, it's kind of in south central uh, um, France, uh, this region that's, uh, let's call it uh, uh, red, <laughs> uh, uh, for lack of a better word. So this red region is Beaujolais. Uh, which is based on the Gamay Noir uh, grape variety. So a completely different region, different uh, soils, different climate, uh, different uh, grape variety, Gamay Noir, uh, but still historically considered part of uh, Burgoyne. So we'll dive into each of the sections. Uh, so uh, generally for Burgoyne, they're food friendly, elegant uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir wa uh, wines. In fact, there's a village in Bourgogne called Chardonnay, where the grape variety originated uh, long before Chardonnay fame of the 1980s and uh, forward. Uh, Pinot Noir's best expression also is found uh, in Bourgogne. Unfortunately, uh, uh, as mentioned with the, the supply and demand curve for these top chateaus and domains, uh, the top Pinot Noir of Bourgogne is extremely, extremely expensive. Uh, but if you get an opportunity to taste it, sublimely uh, divine. Uh, in fact, there is some sort of um, di divinity to, to these wines. Uh, Beauchardin and Pinot Noir uh, express the terroir of uh, Burgoyne better than uh, almost any other variety anywhere, uh, you could say. Uh, and a big part of that is that, that matching of Chardonnay to the best terroirs and Pinot Noir uh, to the best terroirs. Uh, uh, so, uh, pretty much anything from the Côte de Nuit. Côte de Nuit. Uh, so, including um, Gervry Chambertin, uh, La Tache, La Romanée, uh, Domaine Romanée Conti, uh, Claude de Vougeot, some of these um, vineyards planted by the monks in the uh, uh, 10th and 11th centuries uh, uh, have just found this perfect. Uh, slice of terroir 
that once you plant the Pinot Noir and, and, and make it properly and Chardonnay, same thing, and Meursault or Pouligny Montrachet, Chassagne Montrachet, uh, these wines are just uh, just sublimely uh, exquisite and really give you a special uh, feeling. They're, they're, they're central and they're divine and, uh, and, and you feel it almost more than, than any other wine, I would say. Uh, so again, Burgoyne predominantly Pinot Noir, uh, found in the Côte d'Or, uh, both in the Côte de Nuit, which is the northern um, part of that uh, Côte d'Or. Uh, Côte meaning slopes, so that east-facing, orient-facing slope. Uh, uh, but it's also found in the southern part of the Côte d'Or, which is called the Côte de Bonne. Uh, uh, but what's important, uh, or a good way to shop for your Burgoyne, if, if it's within your budget or if somebody else is paying, let's say, uh, is to go by the classification. So there are four four levels almost in a pyramid where the largest production, about 50% of Burgundy production, is in AOC, Burgoyne, so the regional uh, appellation. And then go, moving up the pyramid, a little bit better quality, uh, good quality, good food pairing, come from the better villages. I think there's 44, there are 44 villages allowed to produce uh, AOC village, Burgoyne wines. And then uh, on the best sites of the slopes, better sites are the premier crew, the first growths, and even better, uh, the grand crew, the great growths, right on the ideal site of the slope uh, where there's just the right amount of water drainage and sun, uh, sun exposure and, and aspect and contact uh, for these uh, Pinot Noir Chardonnay uh, vines. So going up the pyramid, you have Aos, Aos, Appalachian Bourgoin, and then Appalachian Village, and then premier crew and grand crew. Uh, uh, that's a good question. Uh, so AOC is is considered the best. Uh, the, the, there wouldn't be a lot of vein de tablet production. And there's uh, for Burgoyne, there's no IGT, sorry, IGP, uh, Indication Geographique Protégé. So, uh, so vein de table is the, the very bottom rung. And there's no vein de table production in Burgoyne. That's predominantly in uh, um, uh, in the south, in the in the Languedoc Roussillon, uh, and some regions have a slight step up, which is Indication Geographique Protégé, uh, but I don't believe there's any IGP uh, in Bourgogne. Um, and then and then the top level is the AOC, and all four of these classes of wine: AOC Bourgogne, AOC Village, Premier Cru, and Grand Cru, uh, are AOC, and and within that top level of AOC. That's where these four increase in quality classifications uh, fit. So Grand Cru is really the best of the best, and AOC Burgoyne is is part of the best and kind of entry level for for the best classification. Stri strictly speaking, for Burgoyne. So if you get into um, for example, the Rhone Valley. The Rhone Valley produces AOC Rhone. We'll see on, on the next section. Uh, Burgoyne, yeah, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, 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 Rhone Valley produces AOC wines and also produces uh, IGT wines, and or sorry, IGP, and also produces uh, Vain, uh, Vain de France, Vain de Table. Um, um, but really the interesting stuff is at least IGP, and ideally AOC. Okay, so uh, moving along, uh, talking. So we talked a little bit about Burgoyne White being Pinot Noir. Sorry, Burgoyne Red being Pinot Noir. Uh, the Burgoyne White uh, top, the all the best quality Burgoyne White is going to be made from Chardonnay, uh, especially in Chablis, where Chardonnay is the only grape of Chablis. Uh, so if you get a Chablis uh, Regional or AOC, uh, Petit Chablis, Chablis, or Chablis Premier Cru, Chablis Grand Cru, it's always going to be uh, Chardonnay and predominantly unoaked, almost always unoaked uh, Chardonnay from Chablis. It's also really great in the Côte de Bonne regions like Meursault and uh, Alux Corton, as well as Chassagne Montrachet, Pouligny Montrachet. These are the top villages also kind of tapping into that divinity, that kind of sublime um, ethereal nature 
Uh, and, and just like the, the red Burgoyne, uh, white Burgoyne is based on the same classification where, um, of course, not being any Vain de France, not being any IGP, uh, it all fits in with the, the pyramid of AOC Burgoyne, AOC Village, uh, Chardonnay from Premier Cru and Chardonnay from Grand Cru being the best of the best with smaller production as well as uh, more expensive um, bottles uh, for sale. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. That's very good. Fantastic. And so, and as, as you make these connections, this is fantastic, Martha, uh, you'll be able to make lateral recommendations. So, um, so for example, if you're at a restaurant and they don't have any Chablis, shame on them. Uh, but, uh, but they do have an unoaked Ontario or an unoaked, um, Chardonnay from Ontario, I know Chardonnay from uh, even California or other warmer regions. Uh, you can start to make these lateral uh, lateral recommendations. That's excellent. Uh, so we'll pull up uh, two questions for our first two sections uh, on the poll. So question number one, left bank Bordeaux with the gravelly soils tends to be dominated by A, Merlot, B, Cabernet Sauvignon, or C, Cabernet Franc? Tough question for you here. Okay, uh, good guess. Uh, it's not Merlot. Maybe I, I don't think I explained this as well as I could have. Um, uh, left bank, because of the gravelly soils, uh, the, the, the soils are, they warm up quite a bit more, uh, being more, uh, so gravel is kind of a looser rock, and those will absorb the heat throughout the day. And, and so gravel soils on the left bank are actually better for Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, because Cabernet Sauvignon is a late ripening grape variety, uh, so the warm gravel soils are able to ripen the, the Cabernet Sauvignon uh, pr predominantly found on the left bank. Whereas the cool soils of, of the right bank are clay, and clay uh, tends to grow Merlot. Merlot ripens a little bit earlier, than a couple weeks earlier than Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, so the cool soils will still ripen. Merlot uh, tends to grow best on the right bank. Okay, good. Let's go to question number two. I know you'll get this. Question number two, Chablis is based on which grape? Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, or Sauvignon Blanc? Chardonnay, very good. Excellent. And again, these polls are, are really mostly to, to kind of consolidate understanding and help uh, make sure I'm, I'm teaching uh, at an okay level so, so that uh, everything's being understood. That's right. Yep. Merlot dominates on the right bank. And also there's a lot of Merlot in Entre de Mer. It's not labeled Entre de Mer. It'll just be labeled AOC uh, Bordeaux. Uh, but Merlot is found throughout the whole region, dominant on the right bank, found in Entre de Mer. And even on the left bank in the kind of the less uh, gravelly soils, you'll find quite a bit of uh, Merlot as well. Try not to panic. It's okay. We're just having a comfortable uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, you got a glass of wine. Uh, again, it, it's mostly just to see that I'm that I'm teaching the concepts okay, and and this is the by far the toughest class for for the five week uh, program, as it has always been for every every wine program I've ever taken, whether it's sommelier at Algonquin, or the WSET diploma, or or any course or book. Uh, the old world, especially France as well as Italy and some of the other countries we'll see today. Old world wines are always the biggest, uh, most in-depth, toughest uh, region to, to nail down. So it's okay. No, no, no stress. But let's go on to our next region, the Rhone Valley. So this is in the south of France, right along the Mediterranean coast. Uh, but it stretches quite a bit far north as the Rhone River, Rhone River flows south from, uh, starts in Switzerland in the Alps and flows south towards uh, the northern Rhone around Vienne and Valence. And then there's a stretch in between where there aren't any vines. And uh, as it descends into the warm expanse of the Southern Rhone, uh, you get into a warmer Mediterranean climate with different soils. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Northern Rhone and Southern Rhone uh, differences. That's right, yep. Yep, so this is, so uh, again, that Northern Rhone is kind of that thin, just follows the river as they're on steep banks. And the Northern Rhone, kind of that yellow, down to the red of St. Perret. Uh, so you can see the village of Valence in the northern Rhone and the southern tip of the northern Rhone. 
And then there's the gap between Velos and the southern part of the northern Rhone. And that gap stretches then further south into what's called the southern Rhone, uh, which is uh, almost a completely different winemaking region. Uh, a warmer climate, different soils, more big stones called galets in the southern Rhone. Uh, putting stones kind of. That's right, yep. Yeah, exactly. So Cote Roti in the north and a little bit broader Cote de Luberon, Cote de Ventoux. Um, though, actually, Cote de Luberon and Cote de Ventoux are, are in the southern uh, Rhone. So for the northern Rhone, it'd just be from Cote Roti to where it says saint Pere in the red there. I think I have it spelled correctly there. Uh, so the northern Rhone is Cote Roti to saint Pere. And then the southern part, you can see where there's the gap, just south of the blue claret de D. Uh, that's the type of soil in the southern Rhone. Uh, so in the northern Rhone, it's steep uh, kind of schistous cliffs. And in the southern Rhone, it's more broad, kind of low-lying riverland with these uh, galets being pudding stones. Uh, so large rocks, uh, really quite a beautiful scene. And they, they absorb a lot of this the southern Mediterranean sunlight and heat uh, throughout the day and, and really ripen a, f a fuller bodied uh, wine in the Southern Rhone. We'll take a look at, at what those wines uh, are like. Uh, so we still have the map there kind of in the small uh, right hand corner, uh, but this was first planted, it said uh, uh, around the first century AD, around the first century common era. Um, and again, is kind of completely different Northern Rhone versus Southern Rhone. Uh, the only similarity is that they share the river, but it's a moderate uh, uh, continental climate in the northern Rhone and a warm Mediterranean climate in the southern Rhone. Uh, also different grape varieties uh, in the two regions. Uh, a red northern Rhone is 100% Syrah, 100% Shiraz. Beautiful complex wines. We'll take a look at some of them. Uh, and predominantly going to be Viognier for uh, white wine in the northern Rhone especially Condria and Chateaubriand. In the Southern Rhone, there is a little bit of Syrah, but it's the most planted variety is Grenache. Uh, and the Grenache is often blended with Syrah and uh, Mouvedre and up to um, uh, 13 or more uh, grape varieties as well. And they, that's commonly known as a GSM blend, Grenache Syrah Mouvedre blend, which is also uh, aped in uh, Australia, uh, which is a great, great style is, yeah, uh, one of mine as well. Uh, and any Southern Rhone uh, is going to be predominantly a GSM uh, blend. So great styles. Uh, so perhaps I can make some recommendations uh, on in that section for, for something you might uh, like to try. Uh, so starting with the Northern Rhone, uh, also some great styles, only uh, quite a bit smaller production. Again, it's a moderate continental climate. Uh, so not as much production, only 5% of the Rhone Valley wines come from the Northern part. Uh, but these iconic regions of Hermitage and Cote Roti uh, are both on steep south-facing slopes where the river turns kind of east-west in this north-south uh, flow. And on this east-west flow at Hermitage and Cote Roti, this, the slopes face south. In fact, Cote again means slopes or hillside and Roti means roasted. So in the northern part of Cote Roti, it's really just a very strong sunlight uh, in the northern Rhone uh, even, uh, and really some roasted slopes producing very full-bodied uh, Syrah-based, 100% Syrah wines. And, and they're, they're age-worthy, very complex, uh, pricey, uh, but uh, if you can get a good value northern Rhone Syrah for $40 or $60 at the LCBO, uh, and these are good approximations of, of especially a Corona uh, or Crozer Hermitage can be good examples of this excellent style of, of varietal Syrah. Uh, for whites in the Northern Rhone, Condria is producing phenomenal uh, Viognier, 100% Viognier wines uh, and, uh, and worth sticking out. They can be pricey as well, uh, but minerally driven, uh, kind of that classic peach and floral uh, Viognier character with lower acidity and really a nice rich uh, uh, feel to it. Also quite mineral uh, from Condria. Uh, moving into the Southern Rhone, again, warmer uh, climate, Mediterranean climate being right on the Mediterranean Sea, 
We're not too far from Provence and Marseille here in the Southern Rhone, not too far from Cannes uh, and the, the, the Saint-Tropez in this kind of uh, French Riviera uh, region, a little bit further to the east. Uh, but in that warm kind of uh, Southern uh, Rhone Mediterranean climate uh, style. Uh, the top uh, region, top appellation in Southern Rhone is Chateauneuf du Pop, uh, uh, but some great alternate styles such as Gigondas, producing almost as high quality as Chateauneuf du Pop, both from GSM blends uh, and some other regions uh, that can be even better value. So Chateauneuf du Pop tends to range from forty to eighty dollars, perhaps. Uh, Gigondas and Vaqueira. Uh, are similar, very similar style GSM blends from the same similar climate with these Galley soils, um, but much much better value. Gigondas tends to range from twenty five to thirty five forty dollars, and Vecchi Rai you can get an excellent value, awesome wine for twenty or twenty five uh, dollars from a neighboring region to to Chateau Neuf du Pape. Uh, some other regions like uh, Côte du Rhone Village. Uh, or different Coteron villages with a, an individual village name on it uh, can also produce some excellent value for uh, under $20 uh, of this full bodied GSM, uh, very complex, very, very flavorful style. Uh, so, a lot of great uh, value to be had. Uh, Coteron, uh, generally, Appalachian Coteron, just like AOC Bordeaux, AOC Coteron is a kind of a catch all for the whole area. Uh, again, producing more or less GSM styles, uh, predominantly from the southern uh, Rhone vineyards. Uh, and just last point uh, on the right bank. So again, the uh, Rhone River is flowing north to south. So if you're on that river, you can picture the right bank being on the west side. It's a little bit hard to conceptualize, but flowing down the river on the right bank being on the on the west side uh, uh, are the regions of Tavel and Lirac producing uh, Ride a single uh, mindedly, at least for Tavel, uh, rose and some excellent uh, quality rose based on GSM uh, vines. So, uh, comfortable so far before diving into Loire Valley, our fourth and final uh, French wine region. Yes, okay. I hope it's not too much. Again, um, if I can offer some advice, the the best thing to do is take in what you can, and uh, and as you go, as you go through your journey, if you read those sites from Madeleine Pouquet, Wine Folly, you'll come in contact with more of these names and regions. Yeah, exactly. Okay, good, great. Okay, so we'll we'll take a break after Loire Valley before going into wines of Italy. Uh, but a, a great region, an important region, uh, northwest France along the Atlantic coast, but it's an extremely long river, uh, the Loire uh, River. In fact, it's longest in France, starts in the middle of the country and then flows north. Uh, you can see it comes here past uh, the Centre vineyards. There's kind of four regional sections to the, Loire, to the vineyards of the Loire River. And as the Loire River flows north past Sancerre and puy Fume in the Centre regions, it turns west at Orléans, you can see on the map there, and then flows through the region of Touraine, kind of that light pink uh, color, and then to Anjou Summer uh, in that more kind of fuchsia, darker pink, and then the fourth and final region, so Centre, Touraine, Anjou, and the fourth and final region, uh, Pays Nantes, on the very west coast, kind of in that yellow, and each section more or less has different grape varieties, different soils, um, and the, the climate's also quite di uh, different. It's a very long river, so a large area of land, and so closer to the Atlantic coast around Pei Nante. It's going to be more of that cool Atlantic influenced um, uh, weather or more of a maritime weather. And as you get further in towards uh, Angers and certainly Tours and certainly by Orleans, Orleans, there's less to know of that, none of that uh, Atlantic influence. Uh, so this is more of a continental climate, uh, which means that in the center vineyards, they have very cold winters and very hot uh, summers. Uh, there's n less of that moderating effect from the large uh, Atlantic uh, climate uh, influence. So different climate, different soil, uh, different grape varieties. Uh, as mentioned, it's the longest river in France and beautiful castles as well as vineyards along the whole uh, uh, flow of the river. 
this was uh, for a long time in the 18th, 19th, 20th century. Uh, the Parisians and uh, France's uh, kind of uh, nobility uh, playground, if you will. Uh, so they would build these beautiful, uh, luxurious castles, chateaux, along the Loire River, which was not too far from Paris, uh, and would have a nice uh, vineyard and, and chateau. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so just just focusing on the on the uh, kind of the predominant parts. So. Um, a lot of the Loire Valley gets into kind of that small detail, um, uh, but just focus. The most important things to know are that there's four regions to it, uh, and we'll talk about what each region uh, has to has to offer. Uh, throughout the whole region, uh, there's there's the full gamut of wine styles: white, red, rosé. Sparkling wines are big in the Loire Valley, and we'll see a little bit of uh, kind of the dessert wines, very similar to Sauternes, uh, in in certain in a certain part. Uh, and because it's a cool climate, we're fairly far north, not as far north as Champagne, but almost as far. We're certainly north of uh, Bordeaux and Cognac uh, region. Uh, and and cool and maritime by the coast. Yep, and then I would say cool and continental inland. So cool throughout, and maritime on the coast, uh, continental uh, inland. Good. Good. Uh, so because it's cool, again, just tapping back into week one, uh, cool region is going to produce uh, high alcohol, low alcohol, high acidity, low acidity. What style of wine might you expect from a cool uh, maritime or cool continental region? Lower alcohol, absolutely. Very good. And high acidity, great, yeah, absolutely. So that's very common, both for the whites and the reds. Sparkling is very high acidity in this cool climate, and generally lower alcohol. The whites tend to range from 11 to 12 and a half percent ABV, and even the reds, which generally are fuller in alcohol, uh, tend to be only about 12.5, maybe 13, uh, for the reds of the Loire Valley. Uh, so low alcohol, very high acidity in these uh, in these regions. So breaking it down into kind of the four regional sections. Uh, so starting with the Upper Loire, again, this is where the, kind of the center of the, the country, of the river originates and flows past Sancerre and Puy Fume. These are AOCs. These are appellations in the Upper Loire. Uh, and they're based entirely on Sauvignon Blanc. Sancerre is a little bit of Pinot Noir, uh, but the whites, the, what they're best known for uh, in Sancerre and Puy Fume are the Sauvignon Blanc uh, based wines. Uh, tend to pair great with salad, which is uh, kind of a tough pairing because of the bitterness of the lettuce uh, and maybe the acidity of the vinaigrette, let's say, or the salad dressing. Uh, uh, but these high acid uh, Sauvignon Blanc, again with the herbaceous character, uh, tend to go really great uh, with the summer salad. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And um, style is completely personal, uh, so that's great. Uh, so again, that high acid, low alcohol wines of Sancerre Puy Fumé, entirely Sauvignon Blanc. Um, they are, they're also quite mineral. Uh, they pair great with goat cheese. Uh, classic pairing, a phenomenal pairing. Is um, <laughs> well, <laughs> are they <laughs> uh, wrong for for your taste for sure? And, and um, you know, I, I find myself somewhere in the middle, uh, where where I like those strong flavors and I like those light wines as well. Uh, but really love the Syrah and, and I love Sauvignon Blanc and kind of that, those mid-range. Uh, but but absolutely some people prefer uh, full-bodied wines like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, GSM. Nebbiolo is a great uh, example of a full-flavored, high-alcohol, high-acidity, high-tannin uh, variety from Barolo Barbaresco. We're going to look at that. Um, some people like a Chablis and a Muscadet. We're going to take a look at a Muscadet, another uh uh, Nebbiolo. Yeah, well, let's let's save that for. We'll cover that today with with Italy. Uh, but there's there's a whole range, right? And and it's it translates to food and drink as well. Uh, somebody who prefers tea, uh, which is why I asked these questions at, at the poll at the beginning of the course. Uh, if you prefer tea, you might like a lighter bodied wine. If you like a strong espresso or a black coffee, 
Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you. Uh, strong, strong flavored foods like strong cheeses, cigars, single malt scotch, especially as peaty, smoky scotch. You might like that fuller bodied, more bitter, more flavorful uh, style wine. And, but there's no, there's no, uh, there's no right or wrong. It's completely, completely personal. Ah, okay, good. Yeah, uh, cigars are, are really on that far end of that that taste uh, of that taste. Uh, but things like blue vein cheeses, uh, strong coffee, really strong espresso or black coffee uh, tend to be more flavorful, re really more more strong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so we have Upper Loire moving further uh, west along the Loire River. We have Touraine around the village of Tours. Um, and this is uh, based on Chenet Blanc is the grape variety. And again, Chenet Blanc is a fairly high acid uh, grape variety, especially in Vouvray. Uh, which is the AOC, Vouvray is the appellation uh, for uh, high quality, high acid uh, Chenet Blanc wines. And also within Touraine, a little bit closer to the next section of Anjou Sommer, we have a, an appellation called Chinon, Chinon, uh, C-H-I-N-O-N, and these are based entirely on Cabernet Franc. So really great style, again high acid, uh, more perfumed and uh, perhaps um, aromatic than concentrated and rich. Uh, but really nice, really nice style, and, and one of the top expressions of, of varietal uh, Cabernet Franc. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about Anjou Summer and the dessert wines in just a second, but let's skip that and go on to the yellow section of Not Pay Nante. Uh, this appellation is also known as Muscadet, uh, and they've named the grape variety after that region. So the grape variety is known as Muscadet uh, in the region of Muscadet, uh, Sevres Amen, for example, and this is a fairly neutral, high acid, uh, very light bodied, light alcohol wine. Uh, pairs fantastic, probably one of the best pairing wines with oysters, uh, and and really quite uh, uh, accessible uh, cost wise. Um, a good quality Muscadet wine is not much more than fourteen or fifteen dollars. Uh, great pairing with oysters, and this uh, is a great style for somebody who prefers. Uh, tea, rice, uh, really lightly flavored food, lightly flavored wines. Um, you can get a great, great example that they'll really enjoy for $15. It's uh, really quite, quite, uh, quite special. Uh, so we talked a little bit about the Crema, the sparkling wine. Uh, so Crema being a traditional method of sparkling wine from France, uh, but outside of Champagne. Uh, so there's excellent Crema from the Loire Valley, Crema de Loire, uh, as well as some great uh, sparkling Vouvray. Uh, so this is a separate appellation to the Crema, uh, and based, both generally are based on Chenet Blanc, uh, although Crema can use uh, red grape varieties as well, even in a white uh, sparkling wine. Uh, so uh, going back to Anjou Sommer, which is the second uh, section, second region uh, from the left on the map, second region from the, from the Atlantic seaboard. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, just the region that they come from. Uh, so both made in the traditional method. Uh, we're going to cover Cremant in week five with specialty wines. Uh, but just a little teaser here. They're both made in the traditional method uh, uh, to, in order to be Cremant. That's okay. <laughs> uh, but different regions. So Cremant d'Alsace comes from Alsace. Cremant de Loire comes from the Loire uh, Valley. And Cremant de Bourgogne is another major one. comes from uh, Bourgogne. And each Crema uses, uses the regional uh, grape varieties. So uh, Bourgogne, Pinot Noir, Chardonnay. And Crema de Loire is going to be predominantly uh, Chenin Blanc, uh, but also perhaps Chardonnay, perhaps Gamay Noir, Grolo, different uh, regional uh, Loire Valley uh, grape varieties. Uh, so just a final note on the dessert wines of the Loire Valley. These come from Anjou Summer, kind of that um, darker pink, uh, the second region in from the from the west coast, uh, and along the river of Léon. So just like we have two rivers converging in Sauterne to give us those misty mornings and warm sunny afternoons producing Botrytis wines, noble rot wines, the Loire, uh, 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 the, the Léon River and the Loire River meet and do the same thing here in uh, Anjou Summer, producing dessert wines uh, based on uh, Chenet Blanc, uh, so different varietal character, but very similar dessert, uh, age-worthy, uh, great with blue cheese, great with dried fruit and nuts, 
um, and great with uh, foie gras as well. Both Sauternes and, and these dessert wines of the Loire are great with strongly flavored uh, desserts and foods. Okay. One question for you here. Going back to uh, the, the wines of the Northern Rhone, this is a true or false? True or false, the wines of the Northern Rhone are quite dissimilar to those of the Southern Rhone. Very good. Yep, yeah, that is completely true. They are quite dissimilar. I know that's only loosely defined, but um, they are quite dissimilar. Uh, different grape variety makeup, different climates, different soils. You get uh, very different wines. Very good. So let's pause there for five minutes. Uh, uh, just take a chance to let it settle in. And we're going to carry on with uh, wines of Italy. Uh, from the three top regions uh, for Italy wine production uh, in just a moment. Okay, so carrying on with our wines of Italy, uh, looking forward to this next major chunk. Uh, we're going to talk about the three uh, top wine producing regions. Uh, there are 20 autonomous uh, regions, uh, autonomous government uh, regions to Italy, 20 of them. Uh, uh, some of them such as Campania, or Lombardi, Lombardia, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia are producing beautiful, phenomenal wines uh, that unfortunately for this course we won't uh, be able to get into. Uh, but we're going to really focus on the three major, the three most prominent uh, regions of Italy uh, in order Toscana, Piemonte, and Veneto. Uh, so we'll cover the three major regions. Uh, uh, a couple of fun facts about Italy. Uh, that I love. It was first named Anotria, uh, which means land of vines. This was when the Greece, Greeks first came over, uh, I think in the 6th or 5th uh, century BC, uh, and discovered Italy uh, just across the, the uh, Mediterranean Sea, the Ionian Sea, and they found gro uh, vines growing everywhere uh, along the whole length of this boot, this Italian peninsula uh, boot, uh, and called it Anotria, so land of the vine, land of the wild vine. Uh, and in fact, there are over 2,000 uh, different indigenous grape varieties in Italy. It's one of the most uh, variety-rich uh, countries. In fact, probably the most uh, number of grape, uh, uh, different grape varieties in production. In terms of commercial production, maybe 30 at most, I'd say 50 or 60, are producing commercial uh, quality wines. Uh, but highly varied uh, and a lot to be explored and discovered uh, about Italy. And it's fine. Uh, so uh, if you have at home the uh, Pipoli, the Antonori Chianti Classico, uh, great time to taste it if you, if you like. Good. Yes, by all means. Smoky, yep, yeah. very good. There might be some caramel, there might be some smoke, um, maybe a little bit of coffee or mocha. Uh, should be a cherry characteristic. This is very common in wine, in red wine, almost more often than not has a cherry aroma. Um, so do you get a cherry uh, characteristic? You do, yeah, very good. More often than not, especially on a Chianti Classico, there will be a cherry uh, aroma or characteristic. So if you get a cherry, what kind of cherry? As, as sommeliers and wine students, wine educators, we're always interested in qualifying our aromas. So it's great if you can get a cherry, uh, that's good. Uh, you know, if you get fruit or tree fruit or cherry, that's, that's a good progression uh, following the aroma wheel. Uh, but it's always important to take it one, you know, another step further and say what kind of cherry. Is it a tart cherry? Is it a red cherry? Is it a crushed cherry or a black cherry, dark cherry, bing cherry, uh, maraschino cherry? Uh, so it's important to, uh, if you can get that, uh, try and see what, um, get a sense of salmon. Okay, interesting. 
I'm not sure. That's that's uh, very good. Uh, uh, on an aroma, sam salmon aroma. Sometimes there can be lateral connections. Uh, for example, um, if you if you made a dish that had salmon with a squeeze of lemon. <laughs> well, just to explain that, if you had you know if you had salmon and you put uh, you know dill or lemon or some sort of other thing that commonly that you common, commonly make with salmon. And then sometimes if you're smelling that lemon, maybe not in a red wine, but let's say you were smelling lemon in a wine, uh, you might make the connection that you're used to smelling lemon on salmon. So that, that might be the, the lateral connection. Um, so I'm not, not sure, I haven't, haven't heard of salmon as a descriptor on, on a red wine. Could be a saltiness, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. Uh, but, but that's okay, it's, again, it's completely completely personal and and completely correct and accurate uh, in fact uh, to, to get what we get uh, out of a wine uh, so if you get a cherry uh, try and assess what kind of cherry if, if you like uh, also look at the level of acidity so again the dribble test if you feel uh, up to it uh, and also that salivation on the side of the gums black cherry excellent very good uh, and also try and note the level of tannin so the level of acidity and the level of tannins on this Chianti Classical. Seems way lower, interesting, okay. Uh, so maybe this is a little bit riper, no tannins, okay. That's fine. The important thing is to look for them and to, to, to assess them. And, and as you practice that with the six S's, the, the appearance, nose, palate, and finish, as you practice it with each wine, uh, you develop that that skill. It is a skill, which means you can anybody can learn it. And the more you practice it, the the better you get at it. Uh, not not sure I understand. So so low, lower acidity or lower tannins. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. So so both uh, AOC Bordeaux Superior and a uh, DOCG Chianti Classico should have some sort of a dentist uh, tannin tannin factor. Uh, and they can be to different different levels for sure. Good. Okay, great. Okay, so let's go into learning about uh, what's what's in our glass here. Uh, so this is uh, Toscana, Tuscany, on the uh, Tyrrhenian coast. Um, yeah, I would say that dark cherry is a good uh, characteristic, kind of that um, uh, caramel, mocha, or caramel um, characteristic. Uh, there might be some sort of wild herb or kind of a fresh, you know, kind of a dried herb, uh, spiciness or kind of herbaceousness to it. Um, uh, it's generally more on the palate. It may be dusty, kind of nutmeg, kind of a really dry, dusty baking spice on the nose. Um, on the palate, uh, typically there's going to be medium to high acidity, medium to high tannins. Uh, this is uh, more of an approachable, friendly, food friendly, uh, and maybe more fruit forward style. So maybe that more dark cherry versus tart red cherry. And maybe a little bit softer, medium, or possibly even light tannins and acidity uh, versus some Chianti Classicals that can be really quite um, high acidity, high tannins. Uh, uh, so this is maybe a little bit more of, an, uh, of a new world or approachable uh, style. Do not like, okay. Uh, uh, we'll talk about how it might pair really great with uh, bolognese sauce um, or other tomato-based dishes, lasagna. Uh, or any tomato-based dish. Uh, regional foods uh, uh, goes goes really great uh, with this wine. It's good. It's good. I like that. It's good to have a good uh, discussion. And again, completely personal and completely uh, valid uh, to, to love, like, dislike, and, and hate uh, what we do. <laughs> good. Uh, but still good, uh, good, enjoyable to learn about them. So uh, Chianti comes from uh, this is Tus Toscana on the west coast, the Tyrrhenian uh, coast. Uh, and kind of that uh, central part, with, with kind of the large central part, where it says Chianti Classico is the heartland. That's the middle uh, original historic site of the Chianti, which was expanded out 
a little bit further to, to kind of that broad central zone in the orange, orange or gold, uh, and uh, based on Sangiovese. So uh, uh, based on Sangiovese, uh, which tends to age really well, especially Chianti Classico or some of these top uh, uh, Sangiovese wines, we're going to dive into what they are. Um, you also have Florence and Siena. Uh, Chianti, the Tower of Pisa, is based in Toscana, of course, around the, uh, the town of Pisa. Uh, Black Rooster, we're going to talk about that uh, on the next slide with Chianti Classico. Do you see, Martha, on the label of your uh, Pepoli Chianti Classico, a Black Rooster? Should be a sticker there. No? Okay, interesting. Um, Interesting. I'll have to check that out next time I'm at the LCBO. Most uh, Chianti Classicals have a, uh, on the back, okay, yeah, very good. So that's the Gallo Nero. We're going to talk about that story on the next slide. Um, uh, and, and it's just a beautiful uh, uh, site, vine vineyard site. Uh, I've never been, but I've studied it quite a bit. Uh, and I have friends who have been and family who have been, and, and everybody talks about the rolling hillsides with the olive trees and the cypress groves and of course vineyards uh, throughout. I think one of the slides in uh, week one was a, a, a picture of terroir which looks like a typical uh, Tuscan uh, landscape. Uh, so home to uh, DOCG Chianti and the heartland, the central historic growing area of Chianti called Chianti Classico. That's what Classico indicates is the, the original historic usually hillside sites. For Suave Classico, Belpolicella Classico, Chianti Classico. And the reason that they use a, a black rooster to represent Chianti Classico as their promotions is the story going back to the Middle Ages where uh, Florence and Siena were feuding and trying to determine where exactly the boundary would be between these two uh, principal states. Uh, and so the, it was determined that they would have the top knight of Florence and the top knight of Siena would set out at the crow of the rooster uh, uh, and where they met, you know, on their horses and where they met in the middle, that's where the boundary, the border would be determined between these two uh, principal states. Uh, and so the Fiorentini being very clever, very, in, in, uh, very clever and very smart, uh, what they did was they uh, kept their rooster, uh, uh, they, they starved it for a couple days, didn't let it sleep, didn't feed it. Uh, and so uh, what happened was on the day of the race, very early in the morning, and uh, the very early hours of the morning, the rooster was being was so hungry and, and tired that it came out and crowed, or did did made its noise. Uh, and so the the Florentine knight started off uh, much much more of a head start than the Siena knight, uh, whose rooster crowed at the crack of dawn uh, in the morning. So the Fiorentine knight came down, and by the time it got just about to Siena, uh, that's where the two knights met, and so that's where the border between these two uh, states was determined. So very clever uh, and that's what they use uh, for the for the marketing for the logo uh, for these Chianti Classico um, wines. A little bit further south uh, in a region called Brunello di Montalcino. Uh, uh, this is also Sangiovese based wine. It's a little bit warmer of a region uh, and produces fuller bodied, uh, very complex, very age-worthy wines. Uh, they Minimum aging, I believe, is three years, uh, uh, three to five years uh, for these Brunello di Montalcino wines, also based on Sangiovese, uh, and quite rich, 14, 14 and a half, sometimes 15 percent uh, alcohol. Beautiful. So those, uh, so as mentioned in the um, aging uh, document that I sent, uh, those will be drinking beautifully now. Uh, if you have a couple, it's, it's worth opening maybe one now. Uh, or in the next little while and testing that, yeah, seeing how it is, enjoy it. Uh, and you can monitor it to see how, how it'll progress. Uh, and I think uh, at least over the next five years, they'll still be coming into their prime and probably hold for, for a little while after that as well. Uh, so beautiful, beautiful wines. Have you ever tasted a, a Brunello di Montalcino? Very good. Beautiful. So you know what you're in for. It's great. Okay. Beautiful.
Yeah, yeah, and just uh, beautiful, complex, um, uh, expressive, uh, savory aromas you've never smelt or tasted before. Really delicious. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Uh, so in addition to Chianti, Chianti Classico, Brunello di Montalcino, uh, there's another major wine cat uh, type, wine style from Toscana. And this is more found along the coast around Marema. Write that in, D-O-C-G, Marema, as in by the sea. Uh, and these are what's called Super Tuscans. And so Super Tuscans are Sangiovese-based grape varieties. Uh, uh, but blended with international varieties. So they weren't allowed to use the DOCG appellation. Uh, so they were, quote-unquote, deregulated or declassified to IGT, Indicación Geográfica Típica, which is supposedly a lower level, but they're such high quality, such good quality, in fact, the best quality wines, along with Brunello's uh, and Chianti Classico from Tusc Tuscany, uh, that they're described as super Tuscans. So giving it a kind of a euphemism to elevate it to the level it should should be at. Um, and uh, and that was all because they were using international grape varieties like Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, and Cabernet Franc. Uh, and some of the top uh, producers, in fact, the top producers are Sassicaia, Ornelia, Tiganello, um, uh, Solaya, some of these other uh, high quality Super Tuscan uh, wines. Also extremely age worthy. Again, because they're having Cabernet Sauvignon with with thick skins and high tannins, uh, and that flavor concentration, they're they're very very age worthy uh, wines. Uh, very similar to uh, Brunello, maybe even uh, a further step towards uh, more complexity. Okay, so comfortable so far. Good. Okay, so we'll uh, carry on to Piemonte. Here in Northwest, there's a map there of Italy, one of these 20 regions. And this is the, the Northwest region of Piemonte. Uh, uh, with the capital of Torino or Turin, uh, where the Olympics were in, I believe, 2006. Uh, and just south of there are Barolo, uh, Asti, and Alba. Uh, Barolo being a very small village, but a very significant one. Uh, and Alba and Asti being the major centers of production, the major uh, wine and food uh, hazelnuts, as well as truffles, um, uh, very rich uh, food food culture in uh, Piemonte. Uh, the word itself does mean foothills, Piemonte. The, uh, it's also pronounced Piedmont in English. Uh, so that might be the English uh, pronunciation. Piemonte is the Italian, and Piemont, uh, spelled the same way as the English one there, is the French uh, pronunciation. Uh, and they all mean in the in the foothills, in the feet, uh, the foothills of the Alps. So these are the um, Alps descending from the north as well as from the west, and then the the coastal um, Apennine range as well. So very hilly region. And Nebbiolo is a noble uh, grape variety given to the best south facing, warmest uh, uh, sites because it's a very late ripener and requires the best uh, sites of Piemonte to ripen. Uh, fully and produce these beautiful, uh, age-worthy, complex wines. Um, truffles and boar, uh, wild boar, uh, beautiful uh, cuisine uh, for this region. Uh, so in the best sites around the village of Barolo and its neighboring villages, uh, we'll produce these complex uh, minimum five years, ideally 10 years, maybe even 20 years of aging for these Nebbiolo wines where they develop these complex hauntingly uh, uh, divine uh, aromas uh, and sensual uh, taste uh, similar to P uh, Pinot Noir in Burgoyne, uh, Nebbiolo uh, in Piemonte, uh, such as Brollo or Barbaresco, uh, producing these really rich, savory, um, terroir-driven wines. Difference between Brollo and Barbaresco, Barbaresco is a little bit warmer, slightly lower elevation, so producing fuller, riper, slightly riper, more accessible, more approachable uh, Nebbiolo-based wines. Uh, a different grape variety, uh, but also from around the village of Asti, uh, is Barbera, is a grape variety. So Barolo and Barbaresco are villages and regions, appellations, uh, DOCGs. of Brollo and Barbaresco, uh, but Barbera is a great variety. And so this is a common thing you'll see in Italian uh, wines, name, naming of Italian wines is great variety from 
village or a grape variety from region. So Moscato di Asti or Barbera di Asti is a grape variety of Barbera. D is from, and Asti is the region that, that is produced in. Uh, Barbera di Asti tends to be also high acid, uh, but quite a bit lower tannins, so it's more approachable, easier drinking, uh, can be oak-aged, uh, and really quite a lovely uh, food-friendly uh, sipping, sipping Piemonte wine. Uh, also around the village of Asti, we have Moscato di Asti, which Moscato is a family of grape varieties, uh, producing very aromatic, uh, can be sweet. In fact, Moscato di Asti is sweet, uh, and its uh, counterpart uh, Asti, Spumanti, uh, are based on the Moscato grapes, so Moscato from Asti. Uh, but made in a clean, fruity style, very nice soils, very good uh, limestone soils, uh, and hand harvested. Uh, and so you do get some very high quality uh, Moscato di Asti wines. A little bit further southeast, approaching Liguria and the, the Cinque Terre. Uh, have you seen this uh, picture of Cinque Terre? Might be mispronouncing that, but Cinque Terre. This is worth uh, Googling, doing a quick search on, on this, these five fishing villages. They're right on the, on the Italian Riviera, so on the south uh, Ligurian Sea uh, and beautiful fishing villages. You, you may have seen a picture of some of these houses kind of right in the cliff face al along the coast, uh, but worth worth taking a look at uh, if you had a chance. Uh, and just north of that, back to Piemonte, but very close to this uh, region, this coastal region, uh, is uh, uh, you've seen it good, uh, is the region of Gavi, uh, which produces uh, dry uh, mineral wines. Uh, a really nice style, re really interesting style, uh, based on the Cortese uh, grape variety. Cortese. So we'll uh, uh, check into our third uh, region of Italy, uh, if that's okay. Uh, so we've covered Toscana, we've covered Piemonte, and here we are in Northeast Italy, uh, in Veneto, right around the uh, city of Venice, uh, Venezia, there on the coast, very low-lying uh, canals of Venice, of course. And it's a large region. It's the largest uh, producing wine region in all of Italy. So the, there's a vast amount of Prosecco from Conegliano Valdo Biadene, vast amount of Valpolicella and Suave from those regions, as well as uh, Merlot, Chardonnay, and of course Pinot Grigio uh, from, from the whole uh, area. So the canals of Venice, Verona is the setting to Romeo and Juliet, as well as uh, the home to uh, Valpolicella wines. We'll talk about those. Uh, you get Prosecco and Moroni. I don't think these two <laughs> wine styles could be any more uh, different. Prosecco being a light, fresh, fruity, sparkling wine, and Amaroni being a deep, dark, dry, bold, bitter, uh, high alcohol, uh, raisin, uh, raisined red wine. We're going to talk about uh, each of these. Uh, and Valpolicella Suave producing large uh, amounts of, yeah, absolutely, <laughs> two ends of the spectrum. Uh, uh, Valpolicella Suave producing large amounts of uh, very average wines, unless you get into the classical region of each Valpolicella and Suave, uh, classicos, uh, where it's more of that hillside, um, um, volcanic soil, um, uh, high quality uh, viticulture. So let's talk about Valpolicella, ultimate fairy. Okay, I could I could imagine that because it is uh, the full one of the fullest uh, dry, bitter, flavorful, earthy um, styles. So let's talk about Amarone. So you may be familiar that it's made from the raisins. It's made from the Valpolicella grapes uh, and wines, uh, uh, but then they're raisin. They're left to dry out in the rafters uh, for three to six months. Uh, thereby lowering yields and lowering the water content, which concentrates and gets a really rich, uh, flavorful uh, Amarone wine. Amarone wine is the quintessential uh, vino da meditazione. Vino da meditazione. Oops. There we go. Vino da meditazione. And the idea of a vino de meditazione is it's so rich and complex. Often dessert wines, uh, Vincento and Moroni being dry is, a, is one of these uh, vino de meditaciones. 
And they're so rich and complex that they don't really pair with food. They can, but they're really best on their own once the, the meal has been cleared and all the dishes have been cleared. And you can pour these complex savory wines and just quietly enjoy and levitate and meditate on these uh, beautiful uh, Vino de Meditaciones. If you're looking for a good value, uh, Amarone, I would recommend a Valpolicella Rapasso. Have you heard of this style, uh, Martha? Valpolicella Rapasso. Excellent. These are great values. They're often nicknamed Poor Man's Amarone. Um, I like to promote them as Rich Man's Valpolicella because they're basically a Valpolicella wine uh, that have been re-fermented. That's where Rapasso comes from. Uh, uh, with the Amarone skin. So some of that flavorful concentration, some of the alcohol uh, from these Amarone skins is being re-fermented into the uh, Valpolicella Rapasso wines, adding that concentration and flavor. And they can be half the price or a third of the price. Those are great choices. Yeah, beautiful. Zanato's probably the fullest Rapasso um, uh, because uh, with Rapasso, you're allowed to use some Amarone juice. And Zanato uses one of the highest concentrations of, of Amarone juice. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, re-fermented uh, with Amarone skins uh, and also juice, especially in the case of uh, Zanato uh, Rapasso. So kind of that $25 to, to $28. <laughs> uh, but but recooked really well. Last night's dinner, but, but really presented and, and refreshed in, in the best way possible. Um, and you do get uh, some of the best of that uh, last night's dinner. Uh, so a couple other, uh, re uh, very well, yes, very good. Uh, a couple other uh, regions to discuss in Veneto include Suave, especially the classical wines. Uh, these grapes, the, the wines of Suave are based on the Garganaga. Grape variety. Organica, um, and similar to Gavi, they're dry, crisp, refreshing, mineral, uh, orchard fruit like peach and pear uh, wines, really quite lovely from Suave Classico. Uh, and Pinot Grigio, uh, grown from the whole expanse, kind of more in the flat, fertile, uh, uh, high water, high nutrient irrigated, uh, perhaps irrigated zones of Veneto, uh, producing fairly neutral, light uh, Pinot Grigio wines. Uh, in the neighboring regions to the east of uh, Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, and to the northwest of Trentino, Alto Adige. Uh, Pinot Grigio does take a, a much better expression. There's more hillside soils uh, with, with uh, less fertile, uh, lower yield, better quality uh, Pinot Grigio wines from these uh, regions. Still with me, Martha? I haven't lost you yet. Good. Good. Couple questions for you here. I know you'll knock them out of the park. True or false, the black rooster is a symbol for Chianti Classico. Absolutely, very good. It's good to know it was on the back of the bottle for your uh, Pepoli. Oops. And second question, blank is known as poor man's Amarone. Blank is known as poor man's Amarone or rich man's Valpolicella. Rapasso, absolutely, very good. Great, so uh, maybe another pause, just let it set in. If you have any questions, you can ask them here in the classroom. Uh, we'll just pause the recording there. Great, so let's start back up with our third section. Yeah, let me know how that goes. Uh, great, great chat on uh, on aroma detection uh, and recognizing skills. So let's carry on with our, our third and final section. Uh, we're going to cover three uh, wine producing countries of Europe, the three principal ones outside of France and Italy. And those include Spain. We're going to start with Spain. Uh, and then we'll go into Germany, the wine regions and wines of Germany, and a small section on the wines of Portugal. Uh, and that'll be it for our big uh class three uh, old world wines uh, so uh, wines of spain we we took a look at uh, rioja at the beginning of class uh, this is covered uh, in this section uh, there it is in northern spain 
uh, it's hard to make out, but right in the north central Spain, you see Rioja. Um, uh, uh, but really, the country is is vast and dry, more or less dry and uh, arid. Um, and but but is the uh, largest planted, uh, largest amount of area planted to vines out of any country in the world. So uh, Spain, uh, quite a bit more plantings than France and Italy and China and USA and Argentina, uh, kind of making up the next major. Uh, top six or seven uh, vineyard land countries, wine producing countries. So Spain's number one for area, but not necessarily for volume because it is uh, so dry. Uh, so the borders of Spain are, are fairly interesting. In the northeast, you have a, a large mountain range called the Pyrenees, and that separates Spain from France and the rest of, uh, you know, the Iberian Peninsula from the rest of Europe, or the Pyrenees Mountains on the northeast border. And then following it along the eastern border is the Mediterranean Sea, you know, just off the off the coast is Majorca and other beautiful islands. Uh, going to the South Mediterranean Sea in the Strait of Gibraltar, just across from uh, the northern uh, uh, tip of the African continent in Morocco. Uh, and then it comes around, you have Jerez in, is in that area, in that southwestern area. And then uh, Portugal makes up the, the western border and kind of the northwestern border. And then you have the Atlantic, along the very northwestern around Rias Baixas uh, and the Bay of Biscay on the top uh, northern uh, border, so the Atlantic Ocean on the northern border of uh, Spain. Uh, so regions, we'll cover four principal wines and, and regions of Spain. Uh, two for red include Rioja. Uh, so this is where the Oja River, uh, so OJA is the Oja River, and of course Rio being river, so you have Rio Oja is Rioja. Uh, was the first uh, denomination origin uh, in 1925, I think the video said at the start of class, uh, and then was also the first DOCA. So just like France has uh, v, uh, sorry, uh, AOC, and maybe more specifically like Italy has DOC, and DOCG are the top uh, appellations for Italy. Uh, DO is the top appellation for most Spanish wine regions, and then they have DOCA, a, 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 a Calificata or qualified uh, DO, and Rioja was the first DOCA uh, in 1991. Uh, the wines of, uh, 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 sorry, question? Uh, they're start, so hearing a little about Spanish wines, they're starting to become very popular and trendy. We're gonna hear more and more about Spanish wines uh, have already started to over the last five years, and we'll continue to hear more, especially wines like Rioja. Uh, some of the other wines we'll take a look at, like Rias Baixas, are really coming on strong. Sherry's making a comeback. Cava, uh, we're going to take a look at. The Spanish sparkling wine is uh, in a state of flux, uh, but has a huge potential. Uh, uh, if you check out your, okay, <laughs> If you I was just to finish that thought, if you check out your wine sh wine shop shelves uh, at the LCBO, you'll see a, a more and more space devoted to Spain. Uh, if you look out for it, okay, interesting. I did not know that. My mom's in a, uh, a book club. Uh, I'll have to check in if if they drink cava. It's a great great sparkling wine style. Yeah, <laughs> just a wine club, right? <laughs> Great. Uh, it's great, Sal. We're, we're going to cover it on the next slide. I'd uh, just like to mention about uh, Rioja. Uh, grape varieties predominantly used are Tempranillo uh, and Garnacha, which is the same variety as Grenache. So very warm climate, high alcohol uh, wines. But the best uh, Rioja wines are based entirely or predominantly on Tempranillo uh, and are also uh, aged in American and now French oak barrels. Uh, this dates back to uh, when the Bordeaux producers uh, fled Bordeaux, which was under attack from a root louse named Phloxra, and uh, came over the Pyrenees into Rioja to produce wines and brought with them their barrel aging uh, ways. Uh, and because Spain had so many connections to the Americas, where oak was uh, American oak was cheap and, and abundant, uh, they, they use American oak barrels to age their wine. So again, from week one, you're going to get that vanilla toast, uh, uh, maybe dill, clove, uh, and um, coconut aromas. And they also use French uh, oak barrels now are quite quite common in Rioja. Uh, it would have been um, maybe cement uh, tanks. 
cement vats. Uh, it was fairly primitive in the in the mid nineteenth century uh, in 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 all of Spain, including its lead region Rioja, uh, until the Bordelais came and, and really brought this new way of thinking about how to produce produce a wine. It would it would have been um, inert tanks, so f cement tanks, uh, and really quite quite rustic uh, stuff. Uh, so these oak, oak uh, aging regimen in the oak barrels uh, was real uh, uh, advance in uh, in winemaking uh, for Rioja. Uh, uh, so uh, moving a little bit further east, this is uh, right around Barcelona in uh, Penedes. Uh, we have a region called Priorat, named after the, the uh, priory, uh, where the monks developed this uh, uh, high elevation, very dry, uh, gnarly old vines in a very dry desert uh, condition, producing very low yields of high quality Grenache and um, Garnacha and Carignan uh, grape variety, producing very concentrated, uh, powerful reds. These are beautiful wines right up there, I would say, with uh, the top Amarone uh, and the top GSM, probably one of the best examples of, of, of Grenache in, in the world. Uh, uh, and for this reason, it was granted, uh, I think in the mid 2000s, a DOCA, so being a, a qualified or calificada uh, DO. Yeah, uh, extremely expensive again, uh, because of those natural low yields um, is a big reason why, and because it's so difficult to manage the vines in, in this arid um, uh, kind of difficult climate to work. Uh, if you can get your hands on one, they range from 40 to maybe 60 or $80. Uh, I think you'll really have a, a wonderful uh, experience with that. Uh, flipping styles to the northwest coast. Uh, so there's that famous expression, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. Uh, well, in fact, that's not true. The rain in Spain falls mainly in Rias Baixas, uh, which is the northwestern kind of Galicia, um, uh, around uh, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, uh, and northern Portugal, but this is northwestern Spain and Rias Baixas, literally low-lying uh, streams or low-lying uh, um, banks. Uh, and this is right on the coast uh, with high rainfall, so very green area, uh, but beautiful uh, complex wines from Albarino, uh, white grape variety uh, that pairs fantastic with seafood and other uh, great dishes, local dishes uh, as well. Um, and very fresh mineral and uh, kind of, again, that pear, apple, melon uh, characteristic. Uh, Cava uh, is a traditional method sparkling wine. We're going to learn about that in week five, uh, what traditional method means. Very labor-intensive way of getting uh, these delicate, fine, long-lasting bubbles. Uh, your kind of $13, $14, $15 Cava is not going to be the, the, the most uh, delicate or fine-natured, although it is traditional method. Uh, but you can get some very good quality Cava wines uh, for $20 on occasion, uh, predominantly at the SAQ, the uh, Quebec uh, Provincial Retailer, uh, selling a lot of fantastic uh, Cava uh, sparkling wines. And so this is a Denomination Origem Dio uh, in the northeast of Spain. It's, it's throughout the country, but 95% of production is from uh, the Penandas. Shifting gears uh, east of France, so here we were southwest of France, now we're on the northeast uh, border of France. Uh, we have uh, Germany, so right at the 50 degrees latitude north in this northern part of Germany. Uh, we're all 13, uh, or at least the, the southwest corner, 11 out of the 13 wine regions are found in the southwest um, warmest spot of Germany, but it's all relative, this is very high latitude. Uh, and very cool uh, climate. So you get these very high acid, mineral, elegant uh, Riesling wines, as well as uh, some delicious uh, Pinot Noir uh, with high acidity and, and uh, medium to low alcohol. And it's a, a, one of the major producers of wine, about 100,000 hectares. Uh, uh, so just behind France, Spain, France, Italy, and Spain uh, for wine production in Europe. Uh, so we'll talk about just two grape varieties, Riesling from the Moselle and the Rheingau and Pinot Noir uh, on the next slide. Uh, but Moselle is a uh, tributary of the Rhine. So the Rhine River uh, kind of divides northern, northeastern France from southwestern Germany uh, and is a major route that flows out north to the Baltic Seas. 
Uh, and one of the tributaries is the Moselle River, which flows uh, west to east into the Rhine as the Rhine flows north. Uh, and from the steep slopes of the Moselle River uh, are some of these iconic. We talked about Bernkastel uh, Doctor. Uh, there's Peace Border, uh, some of these top uh, beautiful complex ethereal delicate um, uh, Rieslings, uh, which is a great expression of uh, expressor of terroir. Uh, uh, and can be sweet with, with the high, high acidity in this grape variety, especially from this cool region. You want a little bit of sweetness to balance it out and give a nice uh, harmony to the wine. Uh, so Mosa Rieslings tend to be Lieblich, Lieblich which is uh, uh, the German word for lovely, which is about 30 to, to 50 grams per liter of, uh, of residual sweetness. Uh, but the best sites are the steep uh, self-facing slopes. We'll see a nice uh, slide on the next page about that. Uh, just like in the Moselle, uh, the Rheingau is entirely self-facing with steep slopes. If you picture back to Cote Roti and Hermitage, that, that uh, east-west flowing river um, where the Rhine turns east-west before heading back north, uh, and this is a self-facing slope along that east-west uh, Rhine uh, River in the Rheingau region. Uh, and this is the top region, uh, some of the best uh, Riesling, uh, in addition to Moselle, some of the best and probably the best comes from uh, the Rheingau uh, with prices to match. Uh, so this is an infographic I designed a few years ago uh, to demonstrate why equator facing, so in the northern hemisphere self-facing slopes, uh, uh, produce certainly riper grapes, perhaps better quality grapes. In a, in a northern cool climate like Germany, uh, where ripeness is at a premium and delicate sunlight, especially in September, October, is at a premium, uh, these are going to help uh, those those tough, cold uh, climate regions uh, produce ripe uh, grapes. So the way it works is on an equator-facing slope. So let's talk about the northern hemisphere with self-facing slopes. Uh, the same amount of sunlight, so a light beam, uh, coming in on uh, on an equator facing slope is going to hit more of a direct uh, line so there'll be a more of a concentration of light versus a flat flat vineyard site where that same amount of light is coming down and then hitting on an angle and hence stretching out over a larger uh, region uh, so in an, on an equator facing slope it's uh, it's drawing more concentration of light uh, which is uh, giving further ripeness to the wines and in these cool regions producing better uh, better quality wines uh, because of that ripeness. Uh, so just last note on Germany, we'll talk about Spätburgunder. Uh, so you're familiar, Martha, with, with German. So Spät meaning late uh, because uh, this red grape variety ripens later than the other Burgundy uh, wines like Weissburgunder and Graubergunder, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, uh, but this late ripening variety from Burgundy uh, is called Spätburgunder in Germany, and its best expressions are in this warmer sites uh, in the south of Baden, um, uh, south of Frankfurt, uh, and along uh, very close to the Alsatian border, to the northeastern uh, French border, uh, and they're, they're a classic uh, volcanic soils, the Kaiserstuhl. Uh, is one of these top volcanic uh, sites and producing some some very fine, elegant, uh, high, higher acid, lighter bodied, medium bodied, let's say, uh, Spätburgunder. Okay, so still comfortable for our last uh, country to visit uh, in Europe. Okay, great, good. Uh, so let's talk about Portugal, just a couple slides. Um, Portugal is best known for port, or certainly always was, uh, and perhaps Matus, <laughs> maybe a more uh, notorious uh, reputation on that, if you will. Um, uh, but producing increasingly high quality wines from the Douro, uh, which is where port is made, we'll talk about that in week five. Um, uh, but there are some table wines coming from the Douro, some really interesting uh, wines come from the Dao and uh, other uh, Portuguese regions, including especially in the south in Alentejo. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, and uh, so not just corks uh, coming from the south of Portugal, which is the major supplier of corks, wine corks, uh, 
uh, come from the cork, uh, cork oak. Uh, uh, it's an oak tree that produces a bark uh, where the cork is extracted, uh, f predominantly from the south of Portugal, a little bit in Spain and some other countries of the world, but at least half the world's corks uh, come from the southern part of Portugal. Uh, so the Douro is the uh, inland dry wine region, a uh, beautiful river valley with uh, craggy uh, hillsides. Um, yeah, there, there'd, be, uh, there'd be competition from either uh, plastic or synthetic corks as well as screw caps, Stelvin enclosures, which are uh, increasingly being used uh, uh, properly and, and well for good quality wines. Uh, so certainly competition for the cork uh, producers there uh, with pros and cons to both uh, traditional cork, uh, synthetic cork, which is generally considered the least uh, quality of the closures, uh, and uh, competition from the screw caps as well. Uh, uh, but where you do still see cork reigning supreme is on uh, aging aging of wine. So anything with a you know Bordeaux or Priorat or GSM blends from Chateau Neuf du Pop, you'll want a, a true uh, natural cork uh, closure uh, to allow a little bit of oxygen as it ages slowly um, uh, in in a good cellar. Uh, so for the wines of uh, Portugal, talking about the Douro uh, being the dry inland region where port wines, port grapes are grown, uh, uh, and we'll talk about that in week five. Uh, but some table wines, so some non-fortified, regular strength, 13, 14, 15 percent uh, red wines uh, from the Douro uh, that are dry, full-bodied, with nice tannins, nice acidity, and a lot of flavor. And excellent, excellent value. Some of the best valued uh, red wines in this style um, in the world, uh, ranging anywhere from 14 to maybe $18 uh, for very unique uh, from uh, indigenous wild grape varieties. Uh, that are really quite unique uh, in their flavor and structure. Just north of the Douro, again, a land of contrast. Uh, this is, uh, we have the region of Vino Verde, uh, which is a light, spritzy, effervescent, crisp, low alcohol, high acidity wine, uh, just south of the Rio Spicius in Spain, uh, so neighboring regions, uh, and more similar to that Spanish Rio Spicius style uh, than, it's, than Vino Verde's uh, neighbor to the south, which is Douro, which is more of that full-bodied uh, red uh, f uh, wine style. And our last region in the very far south, so a very warm climate, a Mediterranean climate uh, with a low latitude, a warm latitude, uh, being Alentejo, uh, uh, producing rich fruit forward style wine. So a little bit more of that new world uh, fruit forward nature to the wines of Alentejo, uh, often blended with Syrah or uh, Cabernet Sauvignon international varieties, uh, blended with um, some some indigenous uh, Portuguese uh, red grape varieties. Again, phenomenal value uh, to be had here in Alentejo. All right, two questions here to sum up our last uh, section on other uh, important uh, European Old World regions. So question number one, true or false? Rioja was the first DO and the first DOCA in Spain. Excellent. Very good. Yeah, that is true. That's very good. And a question on steep facing slopes. It's a true or false? Steep facing slopes in Germany help to ripen their grapes. And true, very good. One of these days I'll use uh, true or false questions where the answer is false, but that is completely correct. Doing a great job, Martha. Uh, yes, great question. So uh, do, we don't cover that in, uh, in this course, but I'm happy to talk about it, of course. Uh, it's a fortified wine, so we will I will mention it on, on Class 5's class when we talk about port in great detail and sherry and other fortified wines. So Madeira is a fortified wine uh, made on the Portuguese island of Madeira. Uh, this is a, um, uh, 
it's actually closer to the it's a long ways from the african coast and an even further uh, distance from portugal uh, but is a portuguese island um, and has historically been producing madeira fortified wine for uh, since it was discovered in the 15th century and the way it's made is uh, uh, the grapes are harvested with high acidity uh, and fermented and during the fermentation they'll add brandy grape grape spirit uh, which is what fortification is all about so uh, fortified just means having spirit added to it to make it more stable uh, and higher alcohol uh, and since they added during the fermentation it'll actually kill the yeast and preserve some sweetness in the in the Madeira wine so it's higher in alcohol it's got some sweetness in a range of slightly sweet to very sweet there's kind of four classifications to Madeira uh, but what's unique about Madeira wine production that so far I've pretty much described a port, uh, except for the different grape varieties on the island of Madeira. Uh, but what's especially unique about the winemaking of Madeira is what's called the Astufa gem. Also known as Astufa, which is, uh, is por Portuguese for stove or cooking. Uh, and what happens is uh, after it's been fortified, uh, they'll age it uh, either in the rafters in an oak barrel in a very hot tin roof uh, attic, basically, or rafters. Um, and that'll increase the heat and kind of matterize, cook the, the wine slowly over 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 plus years uh, for the best quality ones. Or it can be, um, the process can be sped up by heating it in a large tank with a, with a heat coil, uh, which, is, which will cook it in 3 or 5 years. Uh, but either way, you get kind of a cooked fruit um, characteristic. Uh, and the idea of, of heating it was to mimic the cross-tropic, uh, cross-equatorial ship voyages uh, that the Madeira wines used to take. So they would, in the 17, uh, 1800s, they would have uh, casks of Madeira in the hulls of the ship to bring them to uh, the regions there, whether it was the United States or different uh, trading partners. And as it crossed this tropical climate and the warm uh, equatorial uh, equator, and the best ones would go twice, would come back to Portugal and cross the equator twice, that would cook the wines in the hull of the ship. So it's, it's mimicked based on this um, uh, shipping process that cooked the wines, uh, and they do that in the, in the Astufa. So it's, it's virtually an indestructible, they describe it as an indestructible wine uh, because it's been cooked, it's been exposed to oxygen, uh, it's fortified, so there's no... Uh, vinegar, there's no oxidation, there's no, there's, there's nothing else that can happen to it because it's higher in strength. Okay, great. <laughs> I'll, I'll make a note to, uh, to talk a little bit more about it uh, in week five as well. But, but that's, that's essentially the production. It's a great style. I'm really glad to, really thrilled to, to hear you love uh, Madeira because it's, it's a great style. Uh, rainwater is beautiful. Yep, yeah. that comes from the idea that uh, a barrel was left without its lid. Uh, at the docks on, on the island of Madeira, ready to, to take to the, the markets in uh, Georgia and, um, and South Carolina, which was a major market during, uh, you know, the Treaty of Independence. Uh, American Independence was signed with a, um, a toast of Madeira. Uh, so they're going to take this barrel of, of Madeira to the market in Georgia and South Carolina. Uh, and they left it without the lid and it rained in Madeira that night. And uh, they found out that their clients preferred that rainwater style and so mimicked that uh, rainwater production style uh, ever since. Uh, but it's great style. It pairs great with food, especially sushi, uh, seafood, uh, fresh fish, um, uh, nuts, raisins, foie gras, uh, really a very versatile food-friendly wine. Oh, beautiful. Fantastic. Yeah, great in the winter, great as a winter warm wrapper, celebratory like Christmas. Uh, that's wonderful. Okay, so just a quick recap. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Martha. I appreciate uh, that feedback very much. Uh, you talked about the French wine regions, Bordeaux, Bourgogne, Rhone, both north and south, and Loire Valley. Talked about Toscana, Piemonte, Veneto, covered the wines of Spain, the wines of Germany, in short, the wines of Portugal. Major class, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Uh, thanks for the feedback. Appreciate that very much. 
Uh, if you can indicate something you learnt uh, in today's class, that would be greatly appreciated. Next week, we're going to uh, uh, set sail for the New World, cover the wines of the New World. It'll be another big class, not as big, uh, but we're going to cover New World wine regions and wine and food pairing principles. Uh, so a big class. I hope you're excited. Uh, question for you. Um, I'd originally scheduled uh, this course to have a break for March break next week, um, uh, which means we would have week four in two weeks time on the 24th and week five on, uh, I think it's March 3rd. Uh, so if that's uh, good for you, we can do it that way. If you prefer, since you're the only student, uh, if you have nothing on next week uh, and would like to bump it up, we can do week four next week, uh, the 17th, and week five uh, the following week on the 24th. Uh, or we can leave it as it was set to have week four in two weeks' time on the 24th and week five uh, on March 3rd. Uh, completely up to you. Yep. Perfect. That's that's how I'd set it up. Uh, so we'll stick with the original plan. So we'll have a break week next week, and we'll have week four uh, in two weeks' time on March twenty. Sorry, on on uh, February twenty fourth, uh, and carry on with week five the following week. So next next in two weeks. Yep. Uh, that's no uh, no. We'll we'll keep it the way it was set. I just thought I'd, I'd mention if if it was if you preferred, uh, but it's actually better for me. I, I would prefer as well. Uh, to keep it the way it was set. So we'll have week four on New World Wine Regions Wine and Food in two weeks' time on February 24th, uh, and then uh, week five uh, the following week. Thank you so much, Martha. It was great uh, to have you in the class. You've got great questions, a great uh, aptitude, uh, and, a, and a really good passion uh, uh, for wine and, and a great curiosity. So I, I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. That's great.